from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. Thanks for downloading the latest Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. This is Rob Snow White. We've got a big announcement to start the podcast. We have a brand new podcast sponsor. Introducing the latest sponsor of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast is Traeger Grills from TraegerGrills.com. I will never cook chicken or beef in our oven ever again. In fact, I am trying to give away my fancy schmancy Weber charcoal grill because it's obsolete. I never want to use that thing again. One of the big reasons I love the Traeger is that wood-fired flavor you get from the grill. It simply tastes better than using charcoal or gas. There are six versatility options in my Traeger where I can cook hot and fast or low and slow. You can cook anything from ribs to pizzas to mac and cheese. They even have Traeger has an actual list of cocktails you can make using the Traeger on their app. I'm going to say straight off that the chicken is the most moist chicken I've ever had in my life. The efficiency of cooking with pellets, I used two to three cups of pellets tonight just to make wings. It took about 45 minutes at about 390. Now give a little bit more time than the websites call for and add a little bit more heat to get things cooked in time. So far, we've done chicken thighs, chicken wings, a whole roast chicken, potatoes, and red onions. Tomorrow... We're doing flank steak. So please go to TraegerGrills.com and shop for your newest, most ridiculously awesome household item you might ever purchase, and you will be the envy of your neighbors. We're going to hear a little bit from my neighbor, Marine Pilot Buck, who as of now, if you're listening to this, is probably flying a Marine plane over the Cotswolds in England. They just moved. TraegerGrills.com. Trust me. Hey, how you doing? This is Buck Hodgkinson. Rob asked me to talk just a little bit about my Traeger grill. I recently moved to Fairfax from Okinawa, Japan, and uh, when I was in Okinawa, Japan, I was kind of like the, the the celebrity in my little cul-de-sac there because I was the only guy who had a, a Traeger uh, pellet smoker. And all my neighbors, over time, got used to smelling it in the morning. I'd light it up in the morning, we'd go off to work all day, and then I'd return back home and I would just pull the meat off the grill. And so they got keen to this and they started bringing their meat over after I had left for the day. So I'd, I'd leave, I'd load up my grill with some meat and then I'd come home at the end of the day and half my neighborhood will have, have claimed a little space on my grill. So, you know, I, I got here, I started talking to Rob about it a little bit. And, uh, and told him how much I loved my Traeger, uh, showed him what I did, and showed him a couple of my recipes, and, and you know, the rest is history. He's a, he's a big Traeger fan as well now. My favorite, uh, I really, I, I think I have three go-to meals that I do on the Traeger. My far and away favorite thing to put on the Traeger is, is a brisket. Uh, you cannot mess up a brisket on a Traeger grill. Uh, put it on there nice and, and slow. I, I tend to wrap it towards the end with some aluminum foil and, and throw it in foil for a couple hours before we, we eat. But uh, really uh, can't go wrong with a brisket. Uh, my second favorite is pulled pork. Throw a Boston butt on there. I always do it with the bone in, uh, low and slow for... Depends on the size of the, the butt, but anywhere between 8 and 10 hours and you're, you're golden. And then something I recently started doing that I hadn't done in the past is burgers. Um, you know, every now and then we'll just uh, throw some burgers on there for a quick lunch. And I'll tell you, a, a smoked hamburger is a game changer. Uh, my kids love it. My wife loves it. So uh, anyway, that's where I am with Traeger. Uh, huge fan. I've uh, been doing it for... About 10 years now, and uh, I recommend them to all my, bud, my buds. So that's it.
So what I'm going to talk about in this podcast, I'm going to go over the background of bass feeding. We're going to discuss where we fish these patterns, terms I use to describe the materials I use in the bass flies I tie. I don't buy any flies. I don't use other people's flies. I use the flies that I tie myself for my personal fishing and my professional fishing. I'm going to go over material characteristics I do not want in a bass fly. Then I'm going to go over material characteristics I do want in my bass flies. And then the materials themselves and the patterns utilizing them. So let's talk about the background of bass feeding. Let's talk about the background of bass feeding. By now, you should have listened to the Life History of Largemouth Bass podcast. If not, pause, go listen to that one, circle back, and listen to this episode. Bass have an instinctual predatory response as an omnivorous apex predator that I'm fully taking advantage of as an angler. Bass will have a lack of awareness when feeding, which it will ignore surroundings in order to garner a meal, which allows me to observe them close up when the water clarity permits. Taking advantage of largemouth bass's predatory instincts to eat whatever it can fit in its mouth allows me to tie what I refer to as eight-weight flies, or flies that are larger than normal that my clients, whether they're a novice or experienced angler, they can only really throw on an eight-weight. Now, largemouth bass are almost always hungry. We're going to take advantage of that. The hesitant pause before they decide to inhale allows me to watch their behavior and adapt my flies to better catch those fish. I've spoken of the drunk frat guy hypothesis before, that drunk frat guys will eat whatever you put in front of them. Bad pizza, greasy fried food, or in the movie PCU, they wanted chips. Largemouth bass are like that. They're not too particular about what you put in front of them. Most often than not, they're going to eat it. I've been fishing for largemouth bass since I could walk, and I've studied them up close as a recreational and professional angler for a really long time now. And I've spent hours touching fly time material, seeking out the best of the best. I've spent hours looking at them in catalogs. I'm not going to spend time on something that when lost will upset me. These are not heavily time-invested flies that I'm tying. And the term guide flies, I find ridiculous. What exactly are non-guide flies then? They're basically something made to catch the person with the biggest wallet. I think one of the reasons my flies never get picked up commercially is because they don't have bin appeal. They catch fish, and not one single person I've ever submitted my fly to has ever fished those patterns. If they do send them back to me, they are completely dry and I can tell they have never been fished. My patterns are minimalistic and my Instagram feed shows their success. And we're going to go back to a very early podcast with Walter Weesey and his tenets of fly fishing. One of the biggest things I took out of that is no extra materials. There are no eyes, nose, and whiskers on any of my dry flies. If you could tell me what the top of an airplane flying over looks like, I'll give you $1,000. The reason is because we're below them. So if you're throwing a dry fly and there's something on the top of it, the fish can't see it. Conversely, what does the bottom of your sandwich look like? You don't know because it's underneath where your eyes are looking. It's out of sight. So I don't need to add extraneous materials, which are just going to add cost and bulk and weight to the flies. My flies are not supposed to look like anything particular in nature. There is no match the hatch for the majority of my warm water fishing. These flies are meant to be an impressionistic take on things in nature that when in the water will elicit a strike based on their movement, their sound, or some of the other terms I'll be coming up with. And feel free to go through my Instagram feed and look at my flies. You can also go to my website and look at them under my store. I do sell them. That's a great way you can help support my small business is buy some flies to try out on your local waters. I'm going to lead now with the Taco Bell analogy that like Taco Bell, I can take few select materials, mix and match the colors to incorporate them into multiple diverse patterns that fish differently, move differently, and act differently to successfully catch fish. Taco Bell can take beans, rice, and meat, and cheese, 
and a couple other ingredients and mix and match them and have a variety of burritos, tacos, nachos, quesadillas, whatever. I am doing the similar thing with my flies. And if you go back to the fly tying organization of my office podcast, I go through all the materials there. So where do we fish these patterns? We're fishing in slow slack water, lakes or tidal estuaries with zero to no gradient. So the water's not moving fast at all. So these fish have a lot of time to look at and inspect the flies if the water is clear. If the water is not clear, we're depending on the movement of that fly through that thick medium of water to attract them and indicate that there's a meal item passing by. So fish will have more time to inspect, judge, analyze, decide, and choose if they want to eat a fly if they're fishing in water that we are fishing. Fish have more time to inspect, judge, analyze, decide, and choose if they're going to eat that fly in the water where we're fishing them, and they have more time to do that because our water is slow. We're not fishing fast-moving rivers. Slow waters where there might not even be a current. I'm also taking full advantage of the largemouth bass's stupidity that they'll pretty much eat anything put in front of them 90% of the time. And I'm using the density of water to allow a slower transfer of locomotion down the body of that fly to give it more lifelike capabilities to entice that fish. The more that fly moves in the water, the better it should attract and separate itself from other things in the water. My flies are meant to separate themselves from insects on the surface or whatever may be on the bottom, the crayfish, other bait fish, freshwater eels, whatever. Next are terms I use to describe what I look for in fly tying material for bass. The locomotion in water, and these are the terms I like to use. I want my flies to move like a jellyfish, where they move, pause, suspend in that water column, move, pause, move again. If you've ever read Matt Zupinski's Steelhead Dreams, he talks about movement without motion, where a fly can sit motionless in the current or in the water and move regardless if you are retrieving it and putting action into it by your movements. I'm going to use words with my clients when I want them to specifically work a fly. Because most of the time, it's not what they're throwing, but how they're throwing it. Words like undulate, vibrate, pulse, snap. Think of a crayfish moving in the water. It snaps as it moves. I want things to ripple across the surface. I want them to wiggle through the water. I want them to shimmy. I want them to wave. I want them to glide across the surface. I want for them to wriggle themselves along the bottom in the sand or along that weed bed. I want them to squirm. I want articulated flies to tremble and flutter as we strip and move them through the water. I want my longer flies to have a serpentine-like movement where they go back and forth and almost walk that dog through the water. I want flies to have a spongy mouthfeel to them or it's something that feels natural in their mouth and might be something that they're willing to hold on longer to. I want my flies to be pushy. I want them to be wake-producing. And a final term is en tremblant, or the trembling quiver of an object, that you can have a little ant or hopper on the surface, and with the subtlest vibrations of your rod tip, send out those what I call Jurassic Park rings in water where it's just not moving, but it's sending out shock waves across the water, which will garner the fish's attention, and they're either going to eat it, or they're going to just completely ignore it. Now I'm going to discuss material characteristics I do not want. Something like a painted eye on the side of a popper, where it doesn't move. That eye's not looking back behind it to see what's chasing it, or looking forward. Fish eyes will move when they're being chased. I don't like that static profile with no life to it, where it's just like somebody took a photograph with a flash bulb and you just see that one moment caught in time where something is not moving at all. 
I don't like that stiff, hard bodiness to poppers and certain nymphs. There's no lifelike qualities where if you put your mouth on that, it's going to feel real. Poor mouthfeel. Unnatural mouthfeel. Certain things just don't feel right in a fish's mouth. Hard plastic beads. They're going to slurp them up. But think of balsa wood poppers and some other hard-bodied skipping bugs, like a pencil popper. Some of these flies I consider difficult to cast. They're heavy and have wind resistance. Plus, when you smack them off a tree or a dock, you're probably going to cause damage to them. A lot of these flies also tend to be expensive with a hard plastic lip built into them, extra epoxy and other things that just make them more expensive. The more garnishes and things you have on a plate in a restaurant, the more it's going to cost you. Same thing. And I don't want to then transfer that cost to my clients and customers. I'm not going to be tying anything time consuming. I can tie a scorpion bug in three minutes. So I can knock out half a dozen of those in half an hour where one person might just be finishing up tying in their deer hair at that point. Deer hair is messy. We learned that from Sergeant Bass Fisher. We've learned that from Pat Cohen and other anglers. I just don't want to deal with all those little pieces. Plus, you don't want me with the razor blade. Sharp objects in me is a bad idea. Then you have the rigor mortis, the stiffness of death, where flies that when they land look the same as when they're on top of the water or in your fly box or sitting in your hand getting ready to cast them. If they have no lifelike capabilities, to me, that's not something I want to throw. I don't want to throw things that are water weight absorbing, natural materials that will eventually sink once they get slime coated on them. I don't want them to sink when they're saturated with water or fish slime as well. I want things to be buoyant throughout the day, regardless of how many fish we catch or how many casts we make. Next up, I want to discuss material characteristics I do want. I want resistance to damage. That's a big reason I like to tie with synthetics. They can take a real beating. And of course, I'm going to I'm going to say that my tying mentor, of course, is Bill Skilton, and I learned a lot about foam from him back in the day when I used to watch him tie at shows. That man could do more things with foam than most people can do with most things. Again, I want the ability for objects to stay afloat. I want them to be at the top of the water column from the first cast to the last cast, be a three-hour or an eight-hour trip. I want flies that have a pulsating characteristic. When you strip the line, I want them to move, and the legs are going to get drawn behind them, and then you pause, and those legs come out laterally. And then you strip, and that fly might sink under the surface and slide a bit or make a little pop, and those legs are going to go back, and you pause, and they're going to be at the side. That's the kind of motion I want in a fly. I want flies that might flutter on the surface. I've got my foam dragon fly, and we're going to be throwing that all weekend long. It has an articulated tail, and it has rubber legs sticking out the side. It's one of the easier flies I've ever come up with. There's a nice little tutorial. And when a dragon fly lands on the water, it's going to flutter about. Its wings are going to be on top of the water, and they can't break that surface tension. And they're going to flutter about, which is going to cause those Jurassic Park shockwaves through the water, and that's going to alert a bass to come up and eat them. I want my flies to be durable, where we can smack them off of docks or pontoon boats or concrete walls or dams or what other bizarre urban structures we're going to come across on a daily float. That I want flies that are going to last as long as I can keep them held together. Sometimes they fall apart from being smacked off of too many structures, but for the most part, they're just going to end up getting sun bleached and the legs are going to deteriorate and that's when I throw them out. Most of my flies can last a month or two on a rod if we don't lose it. I want flies to have a certain density, the splat factor. When a mouse or a beetle or my dragonfly or my scorpion bug hits the water or a frog, it should sound like a natural object landing in the water. And then you pause because most things that fall in the water pause and then get their bearings and then they begin to move. 
And of course, I've said this before, grasshoppers never swim away from shore. They always swim towards shore. So we can fool fish that don't know this and cast a hopper dropper at the shore and strip it back towards the boat. Fish don't know that grasshoppers will land, swim in a circle, find shore, and then swim towards it. And that's not out in the middle of a lake. This is when you're walking along shore and they jump in off the plants lining the shore or when you want to be sadistic and pick one up, shake it up in your hands and then throw it in. I want my flies, certain ones to have a natural taper to them. Worm flies, streamer patterns, a lot of things in nature are tapered and I want to utilize materials that will better allow me to tie something that is bigger in the front, smaller in the back. I want flies that are going to work with light, whether reflecting light for fish to see them or for me to see them. I need to be able to see either my client's tip of their fly line in the water or the fly itself to tell when they need to set the hook. More often than not, when you tell them to set the hook, they're going to look at you and that fly is going to get spit out. When I yell lift or set the hook, it's because I saw that fly disappear somewhere. And we had a largemouth bass recently that I lost from the canoe that I think was about four pounds. The client went back the next day and picked it up. But I almost flipped the canoe trying to land one. And it was exactly where it should have been. And I told him to set the hook at the exact second that worm went in its mouth. And it was on a four-weight fly rod. And it's one of the reasons we couldn't land it in the canoe. It's because it was just uncontrollable. I want flies that are iridescent. You're going to notice a lot of my flies have a shimmery iridescence to them. And that's the materials I specifically choose in a fly shop that I can look at and move back and forth in the light to see how they work with the light. Purchasing things online does not allow me to do that. I want flies that create a silhouette, something from below or from the side. If it's a top water fly, it's going to look like a frog or some other food item moving across the surface that's going to have legs or wings or tails, maybe feet on them. Silhouettes against the water. And you can do this impressionistically with very few items that don't have to be complexly tied. And then reflective. I want things in the water that can reflect light and alert fish that there's something over there. And again, set it apart from everything else in the water. That has a lot to do with the shad flies we tie. The last section here is going to be the actual materials. And I'm going to go through them and I'm going to pick them up and I'm going to tell you what it's like for me to pick up an object. This would be like a chef going through the farmer's market and looking at things. So first up is going to be bucktail. One of those things that's very difficult for me to buy online. I really want to pick it up and feel it. I want soft and supple fibers coming off. I don't want them to be thick and hollow. I want them to be able to undulate and pulse in the water when we're tying clouds or minnows. Clouser is about the only real thing I will use a bucktail for. Most of my clousers are going to be a kingfisher blue or light blue over white with a little bit of gray in them. And we've had some really good success on that pattern so far this year. But I want soft, wispy materials. And you want to have a variety of lengths, but longer the better. You can always cut them down at the base where it comes off of the actual leather. And... I really only use four or five colors of bucktail, and when I find a good one, I purchase them. I've never seen a selection of bucktails in my life like that in person. And I spent 50 bucks buying bucktails there because they had extremely soft ones, and I put them out on the counter, and I went through each one of them until I found the right color and that right consistency of softness where they don't really bend or break if you bend them because they don't have the hollow air chambers in them. Soft ones that when you pull through the water are gonna slowly move like a mermaid up and down as you strip in that clouser. Keep these away from your pets. Dogs like to eat them. Next up is gonna be cocktail and schlappen. I prefer cocktail or rooster tail for tying collars on things like what originally would have been 
Madden Circus Peanut, which is turned into, I don't know, I just call it the Potomac Peanut now, which is an articulated fly with a large collar on it. And I don't like using woolly bugger hackle or, or saddle hackles. I really like a large schlappen or a cocktail because it has a higher ratio of fibers that are longer and those are going to make a longer collar and eventually push more water and pulse larger and make more sound than normal feathers. And again, these things you could probably buy online, sight unseen, and they're going to be fairly nicely dyed depending on who you get them from. And I'm going to have them in pink, orange, blue, black, red, yellow, chartreuse, chartreuse, fluorescent green, brown, copper brown, so I can have a variety of colors like my Taco Bell analogy, where I can take one pattern and use a variety of colors to make about a dozen or so different color variations. And you can also get them on eBay strong, but those are going to be the natural ones. Most fly tying ones are made to get wet and not run. You can also dye them yourself. I'm not going to do that. Next up is going to be foam. The first one is going to be Rainey's float foam, 24 inches, and I'm going to be using large. This stuff is extremely buoyant. It never really sinks. I use that in my gutless frog patterns. You can take the leftovers and make large Chernobyl ants with them. And those are extremely effective. And if you just need a quick and dirty fly, one inch of float foam with four sets of rubber legs tied in on the sides, which turns into eight rubber legs, is an extremely buoyant and durable fly that's going to catch lots of fish and allow you to tie a dropper, which will not pull down your fly. This is not the cheapest material, so you want to measure each fly or frog as you're tying with it. And I prefer to tie it with yellow because I can see that at a distance. Black, you're already going to have a nice silhouette. It would be amazing if we could get this in a lime or bright green. That would be an absolute game changer to my happiness. The next foam I'm going to say is Evisote foam. It's a little bit thicker than 2 millimeter. It's shiny. You have to be careful with thread you're using. If you crank down, it's going to slice through. It's more buoyant than 2 millimeter craft foam, and it really only comes in one or two colors, black or white. And you can make an absolutely big terrestrial fly with this stuff, from ants and hoppers to beetles to cicadas and whatever. And you can get it in about four inch squares from Hairline Dubbin. And then you can put your solar res over it to make it thicker where a largemouth bass's teeth might eventually destroy it a little bit. You can hear the sound of it. I also am a big fan of 2 millimeter craft foam. I get that up the street at AC Moore, and that is the main ingredient in my scorpion bug. I had River Road Creations make me a custom punch to cut out the bodies for those. And I sell the bodies on my website so you can buy them, and they all look the same. I no longer have to trim them and make them try to be matching. It was an absolute epiphany to me one night to get those made, and the gentleman there did it, and he can make you a punch for pretty much anything you can come up with. You can use two to three layers of that craft foam to make Chernobyl ants and other terrestrials. Pink and green, my watermelon hoppers, that's a pretty standard favorite of the summer, black and yellow. I'll do... Black on the bottom and bright yellow on top. That way I can see the fly from a distance as bright yellow, but the fish see it as black or the silhouette against the sky. Most things you hold up against the sky in the daytime are going to look black on the bottom regardless. The other foam I'm a big fan of is the pipe insulation foam at Home Depot. You get about a six foot tube for under $10. You can tie any kind of cicada or I use it for my mouse flies. That has what I originated my term, the splat factor, with. You throw one of those foam mice from 30 feet away, and everything around you is going to hear it. Pause and start stripping it in while popping your rod tip left and right very fast to make that thing 
wake across the surface. And my hand is going left and right right now. And neighbor Jim is probably looking at me again like, what is that crazy dude doing? Home Depot foam. And I use big bass hooks for those. And I crank down. I've never been able to cut that foam with thread. And with six feet of it, you can tie a lot of things. You can just tie a one-inch chunk of it on and make it look like a foam peanut and fish are going to eat it. Especially at night. If you need a big, dense fly to fish at night, that is the material. And it never sinks and it never breaks. Next up is Crystal Flash Chenille from Hairline Dubbin. And I love this stuff because of the variety of colors it comes in. I sent them an email asking if they can make June bug color, which is black with purple and blue flecks in it. And this is the main material I'm going to use as the body underneath the foam of my scorpion bugs. And I'm going to braid this for the bodies of my worms. It usually will have a nice round profile to it where the material has been spun 360 degrees around the string. It comes in a variety of colors and it is extremely durable. This stuff is one of my all-time favorites. I like to tie in blacks, purples, pinks, chartreuses. There's pumpkin. The variety of colors and what you can do with them is almost endless. I use this more in bass flies as the heads on my hula girls and on my articulated peanuts as opposed to estads, which will tie in but not give me a round like ball. Estads is a little unpredictable. I prefer to use that in my shad flies versus bass flies. And I've got a few colors of these, and I can repurpose them to make a variety of flies in different colors for different situations and just trying to tempt fish with green ones and black ones for eels, purple and pink for random worms. I'll do pumpkin colors. I'll use black and chartreuse and orange to make fire tiger. It's pretty fantastic stuff. Look at your local fly shop for Crystal Flash Chenille. Next up is Marabou. It's probably one of the only, next to Bucktail, one of the very few natural materials I'm going to use when tying bass flies. I'm not going to use this in a lot of my bass flies. Very few flies will actually use Marabou, most notably when I tie my version of a weighted popsicle, which is three alternating colors of Marabou tied in, palmered, over a wire wrapped hook shank with lead or large barbell eyes on it. When wet, it has an amazing samurai sword, chef's knife taper to it, and it pulses in the water. It doesn't hold a lot of water, and the colors are endless, and I can make some very cool minnow patterns with this. And it's that pulsing factor that when you strip and pause, it flares out like an open umbrella and then you strip and it looks like a closed umbrella and then it opens again and it moves through the water pulsing and it's a visual key for largemouth. Now bass are like most predatory organisms like Dr. Jones upstairs. Granted the dude's 14 and a half he's about to lose his whole front row of teeth on the top. At one point he was an active crazy dog and you could put a sock on the ground or a squeaky ball and he didn't care but once you moved it His killer instinct came in, and he had to go after it. At his age, he still tries to catch birds and kill them in the yard. The predatory instinct. When a largemouth bass sees something pulsing and moving in front of it, it's going to eat it. Bass only eat living things, and when you impart certain lifelike characteristics into your fly, they will get eaten more than others. Thus, I love me some marabou. And I have marabou in probably 30 to 40 different colors. I love the big one-ounce packs. Hairline now is carrying them in larger packets. It does make a mess when you tie, so be careful. Next up are going to be puffer balls, wormies. I despise the the squirmito, squirmy, wormy material. It is spaghetti thin and is monotapered throughout. There's not many things in nature that are just a straight, weird little tube like that. I prefer puffer balls, and of course, I originally bought ghost puffer balls from Michael's, and I'm glad I bought about 30 heads of them because the purple worm is probably one of my most successful flies. When I have clients that don't care how they catch their fish or what they catch it on, hopper 
or popper with a purple worm underneath it catches an inordinate amount of fish. They're about four inches long, and the material's tapered. The other great one that I found and can't find ever again was the Fusilli Puffer Ball, or Fusilli Glow Ball. It was a denser material than what I'm holding now. These things should not be left in your car or in the sunlight, in your car, or on your boat, or anywhere else, because in the summer months, they will melt. And I like them because they have a natural taper to them, where they're thicker in the middle, and then they end at a point. So it looks more like some kind of natural organism in the water. And when I tie these, they're about four inches long, one and a half inches to two inches on each side. And when you were in second or third grade and you drew a seagull, it looked like that little M. I want that worm to look like that little M. And when you move the fly, I want it to go up and down. Sort of like taking your arms. Jimbo's looking at me like neighbor crazy. I'm going up and down, up and down. And that will elicit an absolutely aggressive strike from largemouth. I had some kids out earlier this year, and we were sight casting a largemouth from the shoreline, and these largemouth were inhaling these worms. We ended up catching a pumpkin seed that was bigger than my size 10 Chaco flip-flop on the worm. We've caught some big fish this year, and makes me super happy that we're catching lots of big fish. Look for puffer balls, and I'm not talking about the little nubby ones that are an inch long that tie like a two-inch long worm that don't have any taper to them. These are the ones that look almost like a slowly sharpened pencil where they're going to be thick in the middle and then half the diameter at the tip. The one I'm holding now is pink with blue tips on it. Absolutely love these things. I probably have to tie up two dozen for this weekend. I've got one, two, three. Four to five trips lined up already. So I'm going to be gone most of the weekend. we got to get up early on Saturday and set the Traeger for wings to take to our friend's house in the afternoon after I'm guiding. I kid you not, that Traeger is its a game changer. My neighbor today was backing in his car and was like, I smell food. The whole neighborhood smells. And when you light it, and I'm using mine in the carport. And because the fire is so indirect, it's center coming up in the barrel with a piece of metal over that and then another piece of metal and then the grate. I feel completely confident using my Traeger in the carport and it not burning the place down. There's no fire coming out of this thing. It's just delicious smoke. Next up is another natural material, which is going to be zonker strips. Barred and regular zonkers in regular and almost the magnum thickness. And what I love about these is the pulsing nature. Rabbit strips are nearly indestructible. And I mainly use these on my version of Pat Eller's Reaper Fly. And the, this Ultra Suede, I just can't get those tails at a, a price that's reasonable enough to tie in the quantity I need and for them to be affordable to my clients and customers. And the mass amount of colors that I can get in zonkers makes up for it with a very similar motion where it's going to slowly pulse and undulate like a sine wave going through the water. And everybody knows how great zonker strips are that some fish will eat just a zonker tied to a hook. I have these in a variety of colors and diameters. And that's again, something I do like to purchase in person so I can see the actual colors. I don't like buying them and then ending up with a color that doesn't match the rest of the materials that I'm going to be utilizing in that fly. Zonkers are just absolutely awesome. And you can take the leather strip and mark them up with Sharpies and Copic pens. It's uh, one of the most brilliant materials, and it's been around pretty much since fly fishing and fly tying was a thing. It has stood the test of time. Next up, one of my favorite synthetics. This is going to be a synthetic hackle. This is... Scrubby yarn from Korea. I get this at the Korean grocery store. The one I'm holding right now has a hot orange string with a pearlescent orangey pink mylar coming off of it. And I use this instead of feathers on my popper bodies. I tie in the tail and then three or four wraps of this and then there's the head. And it is extremely durable. 
comes in a wide variety of colors, iridescent and non-iridescent, and it ties in as a natural hackle would. And for me, at the Korean grocery store, it's six dollars for three hundred yards, and I need to go up there this week to get basmati rice. And I will be in there also checking to see if they're new colors. Last time we went in, they had six to eight new colors. The purples, peaches, oranges. I got a new chartreuse. And I really want to get a light blue one for my dragonfly colored sliders and poppers. I also like Barocco synthetic hackle or eyelash yarn. If you need to tie just a quick woolly bugger and you don't want to have to sit there and figure out which direction to tie it in or tip versus base... You tie this stuff in, it has mylar built into it, it pulses in the water, it gives great body, which is the term Vince Marinero coined in in the Ring of the Rise, and it's just a phenomenally indestructive material that comes in a wide variety of material. So eyelash yarn, but I like the Barocco. You can go to any craft store, and you can get most of these things now from modern fly tying producers. Back in the day when I was figuring out my flies, I had to order crazy Turkish yarns from eBay Turkey. And I've got some really cool copper ones. The problem is the string on them is much thicker than you'd get in, say, like Chocolate's Filler Flash. And I love this stuff. It makes the easiest woolly bugger in the world. You just tie down your tail, tie down this without any sort of chenille, and you've got to fly. Rubber legs. You cannot go wrong with rubber legs. I use two main kinds. I would say three, but two for bass. Round rubber legs. I use a lot of chartreuse and black for legs on my scorpion bugs and my Chernobyl ants. And I also use blues and reds in my wiggle dragonflies. One downfall of this is UV light will degrade it. So your flies' bodies will last where all the legs will fall off. They'll still work, but without those legs, you're not going to get those vibrations in the water. You're not going to have a nice symmetry to the fly either. It's just going to look like a cigarette butt landing on the water. But you know when beetles and other things land in the water, they tuck their legs in. They don't know what to do with them. They don't know how to swim. I'm also using uh, just flat rubber legs from fly fishing shops. They're also used for skirts on bass lures. So I'm going to use these in my peanut flies. I'm going to use these on my reaper flies and a couple others. And again, these flat rubber legs come in speckled, different colored bodies, fluorescence, you name it. Your, your imagination could probably find a matching color in a catalog. But in a catalog, I don't know what they look like. So again, I try to, to buy these at shops or at the fly shows where I can see a whole wall of rubber legs. And they'll last pretty much as long as the fish don't rip the legs off and you don't let them melt in the sun. That's one reason I don't like to use clear boxes. And after work each day at this time of year, I take my backpack full of gear out of the car and bring it inside where things are not going to melt. Next synthetic material is just straight up tinsel. My shad jig is a phenomenal bass fly. I'll tie it a little bit longer when we're not fishing the shad run, and it's that light, wispy movement in the water where the fly goes up, the tail goes down. The fly goes down, the tail goes up, and it gives this swimming, snapping motion to the fly. Granted, we caught a 17-pound blue catfish on a six-weight recently on the shad jig. We thought we hooked another fish on the next cast. It just turned out to be an invasive soft-shell turtle, which may have been the most foul-smelling thing that's ever been in my boat, and it tried to bite me. So Flashaboo in silver, the original extra limp. And you can get, say, 69.25 is the black and chartreuse and silver one. That's the one I'm mostly going to use on my bacon flies. I just couldn't find a full pack of silver, which is my preferred one. And you can get that at pretty much any fly shop that's Hedron Flashaboo. And it's extremely durable. This stuff is so durable, it, it just doesn't doesn't degrade, unfortunately. But it, uh, it will last on flies for a long time. This is a newer one that I inherited when a, a friend passed away and his wife donated his entire fly tying collection to me. So this is... 
Northern Lights by Fly Tires Dungeon. I'm going to say Fly Tires Dungeon's website is it's pretty awful. It's rather dodgy and not user-friendly. But I was able to order about 15 different colors of this stuff. And the price, it's dollar something for a whole hank of this. And it's crinkly. It is sparkly. And I love this as the body material now on my... I'm calling it the Bass Siren. It's basically my umbrella, intruder-looking, articulated fly with a curly tail. It's the one I caught 15 largemouth on in about 20 minutes at our friend's farm pond last August on the way back from Cape Cod. And I'm holding this copper blood-red color in my hand that has little black speckles in it. And it's just a marvelous material. It comes in a huge variety of colors, and it's... The price too. Now, I originally tried other things like Polar Flash and Flashaboo in the fly, and they didn't work. Flashaboo didn't hold. It's too slick. If I put that stuff in a dubbing loop, spend extra time, it would have worked. But I can just tie this in, pull it down, and it sinks right behind the cone, and it makes an absolute beautiful fly. And I'm looking forward now. I've only had two colors of it to tie with in the past but last week i ordered some it took about five days to ship from montana and i'm very eager to see what i can come up with with this stuff and it's pretty darn cool so that is northern lights by fly tires and i'm putting this one back in ultra suede is another great product i find that pat cohen's ultra suede is softer the other ones you can find on the market, and if you have a retractable scalpel like me, you can cut this stuff like a hot knife through butter. It's really easy to cut with loon scissors, Pat Cohen scissors, or a scalpel. Probably an X-Acto knife would work too. It comes in white 3 by 5 squares, and you can color this pretty much any color you want. I do find that when I use stained by Sharpie or Copic pens, the... Density becomes a little more stiff. So I have one of Pat's leech tails here, which are, are absolutely awesome. So you could buy pre-cut ones from Pat. Like these these leech tails uh, or paddle tails are really cool looking. I find them a bit long, and it's not something I want to cut out myself, so I'm going to buy them from Pat. Whereas if I have the big square here, I can cut out any shape I want and... If I find a random object to use as a stencil on the ground, I will pick it up and pocket it. Most recently, it was a little piece of plastic that held socks together from, I think, Orvis or Marshalls, maybe. I don't know. It's flip-flop season now, so it would have been a while ago for me to buy socks. I did buy socks for that London trip. Then I also buy some pre-made curly ones that are awesome. Those I use on a variety of flies. I already mentioned I use the curly-tailed ones on my bass siren it's got to have a new name coming up something a little more clever ultra suede is indestructible your hook cannot penetrate it and it's going to last longer than your fly itself and it's not too expensive if you buy them you know it does put the cost up to my customers if i'm using a lot of materials in a fly you know i'm going to charge you an extra i don't know 50 cents or something if I'm throwing a tail in there that I had to purchase myself. Because Pats are like six for six bucks or six for seven dollars. So that's Ultra Suede. Next up is going to be Flat Diamond Braid. It's a really cool material. It's basically something you would use to wrap presents with but repurpose for fly fishing. I now keep these in baseball card holders in a three ring binder. Stankish showed me that idea a long time ago, and then Devin Olson had it at the fly fishing show, and, and right there, I think I went on Amazon and ordered 100 packs of baseball card holders, and that way I can keep everything organized. I use this as a body wrapping material just to wrap the hook shank and give it color without filling in the body or giving it density. So this is basically used for its thinness and its colors, and I'm going to wrap the bodies on my hula girls on these. And I'm going to make a tutorial on the Hula Girl hopefully the next week. I just need to get around to doing it. And it's just one of the coolest looking flies I've ever come up with or fished. It's basically 
flat diamond braid, rubber legs, and crystal flash chenille dumbbell eyes. But the movement in the water is absolutely lethal. And it's basically the love child of a couple of squidros after a good night drinking and maybe hanging out near Chernobyl. It's it's pretty cool looking fly. UV polar chenille. It's what uh, I started using that as a synthetic hackle when it came on the market. Most of it will light up pretty crazy on a black light. And it makes the body of the Pat Eller's Reaper flies that I tie of his. Still waiting to go to Wisconsin. I thought we were doing that this summer, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. And this is just a thin mylar y material that is woven onto a string. It comes in a variety of colors. You do need to notice by hand to look at these in the shop that colors are made differently. The copper colors, which I use in my crayfish patterns, are longer and a little bit thicker. I'm using chartreuse, well, I'm holding chartreuse right now, and the material is shorter, a little bit curlier than the other material. So your flies are gonna come out looking different based on the color that it's dyed with. So look at them in fly shops. You're gonna notice that some are longer than others. And definitely use a curly-ended piece of Velcro or a bodkin to pick this stuff out as you wrap because you want as many of these little mylar strips sticking out. And this stuff just pulses through the water, doesn't hold water because it's synthetic, and the myriad of colors make me able to you know, match the tail to the rubber legs to a chenille to this and come up with some pretty cool color motifs. Next up are going to be Flyman Double Barrel Poppers. These things revolutionized popper tying for me. I was pretty much just a Chernobyl ant throwing dude or scorpion bug, depending on five or eight weight rods we're using that day. But these hard, densely foam molded things make it just too damn easy. And having Sam Looper here to show me that you wrap thread and then put super glue on it and then slide the head on really uh, solidified that I should be tying more of these. And I'm about to put an order in for more. We're going to tie these at July Beer Tie at Whitlow's. They come in a variety of colors. I pretty much just use the chartreuse and the blue ones. I like this size is small, and I think medium. And then I've got some of the larger ones that I've tied on a popping bug style with a flutter spoon behind it. And I think it just says eat me on the mouth or bite me or something. Fish can't read. If they could, we wouldn't be catching them. They're stupid animals, specifically largemouth bass, which is what makes it so much fun that you can come up with a variety of just bizarre and wacky things, and they're going to eat it. Your imagination is the limit to what these things are going to eat. And I absolutely love my flyman bodies. They are indestructible. One of them got run over with a lawnmower, and I think I can still use that fly. Somehow it ended up in the grass in the backyard. Don't ask me how. I think a lot of birds find monofilament in the carport and they fly off with it, not realizing that there's a fly attached to it and they want to use it for their nests. Uh, I don't put eyes on these. That's just an extra expense and it's, it's minimalistic weight. I like to run my zuddy leg puller through the eyes and that's where I tie the legs on. And I was pretty much just a slider guy until I started tying these and you can tie them slider. You can tie it head up or head down or popper style with the larger lip below or the larger lip on top. So you have four ways to tie one of these heads in. They're absolutely brilliant. I think Flymen beyond hit a home run when, when Martin came up with these. Next up are stiff nylon fibers. Basically, super hair for tying super clousers, which I love a super clouser because they're indestructible and they're not going to get chewed and torn up like uh, bucktail. But the really stiff ones, I like to use as the tail on my scorpion bug. It's just stiff. It ties in and has a large profile with minimal material. And I've been using this chunk now since 2010. No, 2011. I bought this at the Somerset Show, and I've barely made a dent, and I've tied hundreds and hundreds of my scorpion bugs. In fact, we caught a 3.9-something pound largemouth in a slack water 
behind a rock with fast water coming on either sides. And I told my client, I said, there's the rules of fish. There's going to be a largemouth there because that fish can sit in that water, not burn calories, wait for food to come to it. And she took her Risen Fly 23 PS 5 weight with a worm below it and a size 2 4X long streamer hook scorpion bug. The second it hit that slack water, it was engulfed. Largest fish she'd ever hooked on a fly rod. It was the first day she ever fly fished. We got it in the net, got the digital scale going, and it was between 3.88 pounds and 4.02 pounds. So you can take the median of whatever you want and average it out to just under four pound largemouth. And she's like, I'm done. I'm good for the day. And I had clients cancel that day because they told me that 2 p.m. in the afternoon is the dead time and fish don't bite at 2 o'clock. The time stamp on that largemouth is 2 p.m. It was our sprinkly, rainy, misty, overcast day. Fishing conditions were just awesome. And I was willing to you know, put the boat at the boat ramp, meet another set of clients, and go out for a couple more hours. But they didn't want to go out, the second group. So I had the afternoon off. Stiff nylon fibers. And now the last material is widow's web. And this is what I tie my gar flies out of, but it makes an extremely dense clouser that we end up catching a lot of largemouth on. And it's so fibrous and tangly. I have a Ruthless Outdoor Adventures patch that I cannot separate the material from the Velcro. Hold on. I'm making... I'm pulling harder now. It's been on there for about four years now. Ugh, I got it. I ripped a bunch of fibers, but that just shows you there's microscopic little things in this that get tangled up in fish's teeth. It's got a softness to it that would feel almost natural. It's not a gummy type, you know, squishy material, but it has a soft enough body to it that a large mouth is going to suck it in. The largest large mouth we caught last year was on a clouser. It's the only fish we caught that day. We were targeting gar in a specific section during a three inch rainstorm day. And we got one fish all day, and it was a monster largemouth. It was on this material. So that's about it for the materials that I have collected over the years. And how I utilize them, that's how many, uh, let's see, how many materials was that that I use? Let me go up here, and let's count 17 materials that I utilize in a few patterns to catch largemouth. And I'm looking over my bench right now and I've got the Sawyer's imitation killer bug yarn. You'd be surprised that a largemouth bass will eat a size 10 killer bug, but they do. I don't question a lot of the things that largemouth do. As long as they're eating and making my clients smile, I'm a happy dude. And when I get out and get to fish myself and get some largemouth, I'm a happy dude. And I probably could have included in here my Helgramite yarn maybe some other things looking around my office, but these are the majority of the materials that I tie with, and I think you should go out and purchase some and try them out yourself and tell me how you did. They're not very expensive, they're readily available, and there's tutorials for just about everything that I mentioned today on my YouTube channel, Rob Snow White. So I thank you for downloading this podcast. We're going to get back into interviews hopefully soon. It's just weird schedules. We were supposed to meet with someone in Manhattan two weeks ago for an interview. That fell through. Another person's wife just had a kid. People are traveling. So the interviews are lined up. It's just trying to get people with their busy schedules to sit down and commit for an hour. This podcast has been brought to you by TragerGrills.com. And this podcast has been produced by Jason Reef from freestone that is it for now i hope you all have a good afternoon evening morning commute evening commute or wherever you're listening to this please rate this podcast on itunes it is currently rated in the top 20 in the outdoor category and i can only thank all of you for downloading and listening and telling your friends about the podcast Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com.
Sportsgeschichtepodcast.com This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.